Part four of Dam a Book of Calumny. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dam a Book of Calumny by H. L. Mencken. Part four. Thirty one. The Holy Estate. Marriage is always a man's second choice. It is entered upon more often than not as the safest form of intrigue. The caitiff yields quickest. The man who loves danger and adventure holds out longest. Behind it one frequently finds not that lofty romantic passion which poets him, but a mere yearning for peace and security. The abominable hazards of the high seas the rough humors and pestilences of the forecastle. These drive the timid mariner ashore. The authentic Cupid, at least in Christendom, was discovered by the late Albert Ludwig Sigmund Neiser in 1879. 32. Deichtung und Wahrheit Deponent, being duly sworn, saith, My taste in poverty is for delicate and fragile things, to be honest, for artificial things. I like a frail but perfectly articulated stanza, a sonnet wrought like ivory, a song full of glowing nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns, conjunctions, prepositions, and participles but without too much hard sense to it. Poetry, to me, has but two meanings. On the one hand, it is a magical escape from the sordidness of metabolism and the class war, and on the other hand, it is a subtle, very difficult, and hence very charming art, like writing fugues or mixing mayonnaise. I do not go to poets to be taught anything, or to be heated up to indignation, or to have my conscience blasted out of its torpor, but to be soothed and caressed, to be lulled with sweet sounds, to be wooed into forgetfulness, to be tickled under the metaphysical chin. My favorite poem is Lizette Woodworth Reese's Tears, which, as a statement of fact, seems to me to be as idiotic as the book of Revelation. The poetry I regard least is such stuff as that of Robert Browning and Matthew Arnold, which argues and illuminates. I dislike poetry of intellectual content as much as I dislike women of intellectual content and for the same reason. 33. Wild Shots If I had the time, and there were no sweeter follies offering, I should like to write an essay on the books that have quite failed of achieving their original purposes, and are yet of respectable use and potency for other purposes. For example, the Book of Revelation. The obvious aim of the learned author of this work was to bring the early Christians into accord by telling them authoritatively what to expect and hope for. Its actual effect during 1800 years has been to split them into a multitude of camps and so set them to denouncing damning, jailing, and murdering one another. Again, consider the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini. Ben wrote it to prove that he was an honest man, a mirror of all the virtues, an injured innocent. The world, reading it, hails him respectfully as the noblest, the boldest, the gaudiest liar that ever lived. 
again turned to Gulliver's travels. The thing was planned by its revered author as a devastating satire, a terrible piece of cynicism. It survives as a storybook for sucklings. Yet again there is Hamlet. Shakespeare wrote it frankly to make money for a theatrical manager. It has lost money for theatrical managers ever since. Yet again, there is Caesar's De Bello Gallico. Julius composed it to thrill and arouse the Romans. Its sole use today is to stupefy and sicken schoolboys. Finally, there is the celebrated book of General F. von Bernhardi. He wrote it to inflame Germany. Its effect was to inflame England. The list might be lengthened almost ad infinitum. When a man writes a book, he fires a machine gun into a wood. The game he brings down often astonishes him, and sometimes horrifies him. Consider the case of Ibsen. After my book on Nietzsche, I was actually invited to lecture at Princeton. 34. Beethoven Romain Roland's Beethoven, one of the cornerstones of his celebrity as a critic, is based upon a thesis that is of almost inconceivable inaccuracy. To wit, the thesis that old Ludwig was an apostle of joy and that his music reveals his determination to experience and utter it, in spite of all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Nothing could be more absurd. Joy and truth was precisely the emotion that Beethoven could never conjure up. It simply was not in him. Turn to the scherzo of any of his trios, quartets, sonatas, or symphonies. A sardonic waggishness is there, and sometimes even a wistful sort of merriment. But joy in the real sense? A kicking up of legs, a light-heartedness, a complete freedom from care, is not to be found. It is in Haydn, it is in Schubert, and it is often in Mozart, but it is no more in Beethoven than it is in Tchaikovsky. Even the hymn to joy at the end of the Ninth Symphony narrowly escapes being a gruesome parody on the thing itself. A conscious effort is in every note of it. It is almost as lacking in spontaneity as, if it were imaginable at all, a piece of Vers Libre by Augustus Montague Toplady. Nay, Ludwig was no leaping buck, nor was it his deafness, nor poverty, nor the crimes of his rascally nephew that pumped joy out of him. The truth is that he lacked it from birth. He was born a Puritan, and though a Puritan may also become a great man, as witness Herbert Spencer and Beelzebub, he can never throw off being a Puritan. Beethoven stemmed from the Low Countries, and the Low Countries in those days were full of Puritan refugees. The very name in its first incarnation may have been Bare Bones. If you want to comprehend the authentic man, don't linger over Roland's fancies, but go to his own philosophizings, as garnered in Beethoven, the man and the artist, by Friedrich Kirst, Englished by Krebiel. Here you will find a collection of moral banalities that would have delighted Jonathan Edwards, a collection that might well be emblazoned on gilt cards and hung in Sunday schools. He begins with a naive anthropomorphism that is now almost perished from the world. He ends with a solemn repudiation of adultery. But a great man, my masters, a great man. We have enough biographies of him, 
and Talmuds upon his works. Who will do a full-length psychological study of him? Thirty-five. The Tone Art The notion that the aim of art is to fix the shifting aspects of nature, that all art is primarily representative, this notion is as unsound as the theory that Friday is an unlucky day, and is dying as hard. One even finds some trace of it in Anatole France, surely a man who should have known better. The true function of art is to criticize embellish and edit nature, particularly to edit it, and so make it coherent and lovely. The artist is a sort of impassioned proofreader, blue penciling the lapsus calamy of God. The sounds in a Beethoven symphony, even the pastoral, are infinitely more orderly, varied, and beautiful than those of the woods. The worst flute is never as bad as the worst soprano. The best violoncello is immeasurably better than the best tenor. All first-rate music suffers by the fact that it has to be performed by human beings. That is, that nature must be permitted to corrupt it. The performance one hears in a concert hall or opera house is no more than a baroque parody upon the thing the composer imagined. In an orchestra of eighty men, there is inevitably at least one man with a sore thumb or bad kidneys or a brutal wife or kaisenjammer, and one is enough. Some day, the natural clumsiness and imperfection of fingers, lips, and larynxes will be overcome by mechanical devices and we shall have Beethoven and Mozart and Schubert in such wonderful and perfect beauty that it will be almost unbearable. If half as much ingenuity had been lavished upon music machines as has been lavished upon the telephone and the steam engine, we would have had mechanical orchestras long ago. Mechanical pianos are already here. Piano players bound to put some value on the tortures of Cersny, affect to laugh at all such contrivances. But that is no more than a pale phosphorescence of an outrage wills or mocked. Setting aside half a dozen, perhaps a dozen, great masters of a moribund craft, who will say that the average mechanical piano is not as competent as the average pianist? When the human performer of music goes the way of the galley slave, the charm of personality, of course, will be pumped out of the performance of music. But the charm of personality does not help music. It hinders it. It is not a reinforcement to music. It is a rival. When a beautiful singer comes upon the stage, two shows, as it were, go on at once. First, the music show, and then the arms, shoulders, neck, nose, ankles, eyes, hips, calves, and ruby lips, in brief, the sex show. The second of these shows, to the majority of persons present, is more interesting than the first. To the men, because of the sex interest, and to the women because of the professional or technical interest, and so music is forced into the background. What it becomes, indeed, is no more than a half-heard accompaniment to an imagined anecdote, just as color, line, and mass become mere accomplishments to an anecdote in a picture by an English academician or by a sentimental German of the Bokelin school. The purified and dephlogiscated music of the future, to be sure, will never appeal to the mob, 
which will keep on demanding its chance to gloat over gaudy, voluptuous women and fat, scandalous tenors. The mob, even disregarding its insatiable appetite for the improper, is a natural hero-worshipper. It loves not the beautiful, but the strange, the unprecedented, the astounding. It suffers from an incurable heliogabalisma. A soprano who can gargle her way up to G-sharp and altissimo interests it almost as much as a contralto who has slept publicly with a grand duke. If it cannot get the tenor who receives three thousand dollars a night, it will take the tenor who fought the manager with bung starters last Tuesday. But this is merely saying that the tastes and desires of the mob have nothing to do with music as an art. For its ears, as for its eyes, it demands anecdotes. On the one hand, the suicide symphony, the forge and the forest, and the general run of Italian opera, and on the other hand, such things as the Angelus, playing grandpa, and the so-called Mona Lisa. It cannot imagine art as devoid of moral content, as beauty pure and simple. It always demands something to edify it, or, failing that, to shock it. These concepts, of the edifying and the shocking, are closer together in the psyche than most persons imagine. The one, in fact, depends on the other. Without some definite notion of the improving, it is almost impossible to conjure up an active notion of the improper. All salacious art is addressed, not to the damned, but to the consciously saved. It is Sunday school superintendents, not bartenders, who chiefly patronize peep shows and know the dirty books, and have a high artistic admiration for sopranos of superior gluteal development. The man who has risen above the petty ethical superstitions of Christendom gets little pleasure out of impropriety, for very few ordinary phenomena seem to him to be improper. Thus a Frenchman, viewing the undraped statues which bedizen his native galleries of art, either enjoys them in a purely aesthetic fashion, which is seldom possible save when he is in liquor, or confesses frankly that he doesn't like them at all, whereas the visiting Americano is so powerfully shocked and fascinated by them that one finds him the same evening in places where no respectable man ought to go. All art to this fellow must have a certain bodiness, or he cannot abide it, his favorite soprano in the opera house is not the fat and middle-aged lady who can actually sing, but the girl with the bare back and translucent drawers. Condescending to the concert hall, he is bored by the posse of enemy aliens in funeral black, and so demands a vocal soloist, that is, a gaudy creature of such advanced corsetting that she can make him forget Bach for a while, and turns his thoughts pleasantly to amorous intrigue. In all this, of course, there is nothing new. Other and better men have noted the damage that the personal equation does to music, and some of them have even sought ways out. For example, Richard Strauss. His so-called ballet, Joseph's Legend, produced in Paris just before the war, is an attempt to write an opera without singers. All of the music is in the orchestra. The folks on the stage merely go through a pointless pantomime. Their main function is to entertain the eye with shifting colors. Thus, the romantic sentiments of Yosef are announced, not by some eye-rolling tenor, but by the first second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth violins. It is a Strauss score, with the incidental aid of the woodwind, the brass, the percussion, and the rest of the strings. 
and the heroine's reply is made not by a soprano with a cold but by an honest man playing a flute the next step will be the substitution of marionettes for actors the removal of the orchestra to a sort of trench out of sight of the audience is already an accomplished fact at munich the end perhaps will be music purged of its current pantomime in brief music thirty six zoos i often wonder how much sound and nourishing food is fed to the animals in the zoological gardens of america every week and try to figure out what the public gets in return for the cost thereof the annual bill must surely run into millions one is constantly hearing how much beef a lion downs at a meal and how many tons of hay an elephant dispatches in a month and to what end to the end principally that a horde of superintendents and keepers may be kept in easy jobs to the end secondarily that the least intelligent minority of the population may have an idiotic show to gape at on Sunday afternoons, and that the young of the species may be instructed in the methods of amour prevailing among chimpanzees, and become privy to the technique employed by jaguars, hyenas, and polar bears in ridding themselves of lice. So far as I can make out, after laborious visits to all the chief zoos of the nation, no other imaginable purpose is served by their existence. One hears constantly, true enough, mainly from the gentlemen they support, that they are educational. But how? Just what sort of instruction do they radiate, and what is its value? I have never been able to find out. The sober truth is that they are no more educational than so many firemen's parades or displays of skyrockets, and that all they actually offer to the public in return for the taxes wasted upon them is a form of idle and witless amusement, compared to which a visit to a penitentiary or even to Congress or a state legislature in session is informing, stimulating, and ennobling. Education your grandmother Show me a schoolboy who has ever learned anything valuable or important by watching a mangy old lion snoring away in its cage, or a family of monkeys fighting for peanuts. To get any useful instruction out of such a spectacle is palpably impossible. Not even a college professor is improved by it. The most it can imaginably impart is that the stripes of a certain sort of tiger run one way and the stripes of another sort some other way that hyenas and polecats smell worse than greek busboys that the latin name of the raccoon who was unheard of by the romans is procyon latour for the dissemination of such banal knowledge absurdly omitted and effectively taken in the taxpayers of the united states are mulcted in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. As well make them pay for teaching policemen the theory of least squares, or for instructing roosters in the laying of eggs. But zoos, it is argued, are of scientific value. They enable learned men to study this or that. Again, the facts blast the theory. No scientific discovery of any value whatsoever, even to the animals themselves, has ever come out of a zoo. The zoo scientist is the old woman of zoology, and his alleged wisdom is usually exhibited not in the groves of actual learning, but in the yellow journals. He is to biology what the late Camille Flammarion was to astronomy, which is to say it's court jester and reductio ad absurdum. When he leaps into public notice with some new pearl of knowledge, 
It commonly turns out to be no more than the news that Marie Baskertseff, the Russian lady walrus, has had her teeth plugged with zinc and is expecting twins. Or that Pisposh, the man-eating alligator, is down with locomotor ataxia. Or that Damon the grizzly has just finished his brother Pythias in the tenth round, chewing off his tail, nose, and remaining ear. Science, of course, has its uses for the lower animals. A diligent study of their livers and lights helps to an understanding of the anatomy and physiology, and particularly of the pathology of man. They are necessary aids in devising and manufacturing many remedial agents, and in testing the virtues of those already devised. Out of the mute agonies of a rabbit or a calf may come relief for a baby with diphtheria, or means for an archdeacon to escape the consequences of his youthful follies. Moreover, something valuable is to be got out of a mere study of their habits, instincts, and ways of mind. Knowledge that by analogy may illuminate the parallel doings of the genus Homo, and so enable us to comprehend the primitive mental processes of congressmen, morons, and the revered clergy. But it must be obvious that none of these studies can be made in a zoo. The zoo animals, to begin with, provide no material for the biologist. He can find out no more about their insides than what he discerns from a safe distance and through the bars. He is not allowed to try his germs and specifics upon them. He is not allowed to vivisect them. If he would find out what goes on in the animal body under this condition or that, he must turn from the inhabitants of the zoo to the customary guinea pigs and street dogs and buy or steal them for himself. Nor does he get any chance for profitable inquiry when zoo animals die usually of lack of exercise or ignorant doctoring, for their carcasses are not handed to him for autopsy, but at once stuffed with gypsum and excelsior and placed in some museum. Least of all do zoos produce any new knowledge about animal behavior. Such knowledge must be got not from animals penned up and tortured, but from animals in a state of nature. A college professor studying the habits of the giraffe, for example, and confining his observations to specimens in zoos, would inevitably come to the conclusion that the giraffe is a sedentary and melancholy beast, standing immovable for hours at a time, and employing an Italian to feed him hay and cabbages. As well proceed to a study of the psychology of a jurist consult by first immersing him in Sing Sing, or of a juggler by first cutting off his hands. Knowledge so gained is inaccurate and imbecile knowledge. Not even a college professor, if sober, would give it any faith and credit. There remains, then, the only true utility of a zoo. It is a childish and pointless show for the unintelligent, in brief, for children, nursemaids, visiting yokels, and the generality of the defective. Should the taxpayers be forced to sweat millions for such a purpose? I think not. The sort of man who likes to spend his time watching a cage of monkeys chase one another, or a lion gnaw its tail, or a lizard catch flies, is precisely the sort of man whose mental weakness should be combated at the public expense and not fostered. He is a public liability and a public menace, and society should seek to improve him. Instead of that, we spend a lot of money to feed his degrading appetite and further paralyze his mind. It is precisely as if the community provided free champagne for dipsomaniacs or hired lecturers to convert the army to the doctrines of the Bolsheviki. Of the abominable cruelties practiced in zoos, it is unnecessary to make mention. 
Even assuming that all the keepers are men of delicate natures and ardent zoophiles, which is about as safe as assuming that the keepers of a prison are all sentimentalists and weep for the sorrows of their charges, it must be plain that the work they do involves an endless war upon the native instincts of the animals, and that they must thus inflict the most abominable tortures every day. What could be a sadder sight than a tiger in a cage, save it be a formous monkey climbing despairingly up a barked stump, or an eagle chained to its roost? How can man be benefited and made better by robbing the seal of its arctic ice, the hippopotamus of its soft wallow, the buffalo of its open range, the lion of its kingship, the birds of their air? I am no sentimentalist, God knows. I am in favor of vivisection unrestrained, so long as the vivisectionist knows what he is about. I advocate clubbing a dog that barks unnecessarily, which all dogs do. I enjoy hangings, particularly of converts to the evangelical faiths. The crunch of a cockroach is music to my ears. But when the day comes to turn the prisoners of the zoo out of their cages, if it is only to lead them to the swifter, kinder knife that the Chauche, I shall be present and rejoicing. And if anyone present thinks to suggest that it would be a good plan to celebrate the day by shooting the whole zoo faculty, I shall have a revolver in my pocket and a sound eye in my head. 37 on hearing Mozart. The only permanent values in the world are truth and beauty, and of these it is probable that truth is lasting only in so far as it is a function and manifestation of beauty, a projection of feeling in terms of idea. The world is a charnel house of dead religions. Where are all the faiths of the Middle Ages so complex and yet so precise? But all that was essential in the beauty of the Middle Ages still lives. This is the heritage of man, but not of men. The great majority of men are not even aware of it. Their participation in the progress of the world and even in the history of the world, is infinitely remote and trivial. They live and die at bottom as animals live and die. The human race, as a race, is scarcely cognizant of their existence. They haven't even definite number. But stand grouped together as X, the quantity unknown, and not worth knowing. Thirty-eight, The Road to Doubt The first effect of what used to be called natural philosophy is to fill its devotee with wonder at the marvels of God. This explains why the pursuit of science, so long as it remains superficial, is not incompatible with the most naive sort of religious faith. But the moment the student of the sciences passes this stage of childlike amazement and begins to investigate the inner workings of natural phenomena, he begins to see how ineptly many of them are managed, and so he tends to pass from awe of the Creator to criticism of the Creator, and once he has crossed that bridge he has ceased to be a believer. One finds plenty of neighborhood physicians, amateur botanists, high school physics teachers, and other such quasi-scientists in the pews on Sunday. But one never sees a Huxley there, or a Darwin, or an Ehrlich. 39. A New Use for Churches The argument by design, it may be granted, 
establishes a reasonable ground for accepting the existence of God. It makes belief, at all events, quite as intelligible as unbelief. But when the theologians take their step from the existence of God to the goodness of God, they tread upon much less firm earth. How can one see any proof of that goodness in the senseless and intolerable sufferings of man, his helplessness, the brief and troubled span of his life, the inexplicable disproportion between his deserts and his rewards, the tragedy of his soaring aspirations, the worst tragedy of his dumb questioning? Granting the existence of God, a house dedicated to him naturally follows. He is all-important. It is fit that man should take some notice of him. But why praise and flatter him for his unspeakable cruelties? Why forget so supinely his failures to remedy the easily remediable? Why indeed devote the churches exclusively to worship? Why not give them over now and then to justifiable indignation meetings? Perhaps men will incline to this idea later on. It is not inconceivable, indeed, that religion will one day cease to be a poltroonish acquiescence and become a vigorous and insistent criticism. If God can hear a petition, what ground is there for holding that he would not hear a complaint? It might indeed please him to find his creatures grown so self-reliant and reflective. More, it might even help him to get through his infinitely complex and difficult work. Theology has already moved toward such notions. It has abandoned the primitive doctrine of God's arbitrariness and indifference, and substituted the doctrine that he is willing and even eager to hear the desires of his creatures that is, their private notions born of experience as to what would be best for them. Why assume that those notions would be any the less worth hearing and heeding if they were cast in the form of criticism and even of denunciation? Why hold that the God who can understand and forgive even treason could not understand and forgive remonstrance? 40. The Root of Religion The idea of literal truth crept into religion relatively late. It is the invention of lawyers, priests, and cheesemongers. The idea of mystery long preceded it. And at the heart of that idea of mystery was an idea of beauty, that is, an idea that this or that view of the celestial and infernal processes presented a satisfying picture of form, rhythm, and organization. Once this view was adopted as satisfying, its professional interpreters and their dupes sought to reinforce it by declaring it true. The same flow of reasoning is familiar on lower planes. The average man does not get pleasure out of an idea because he thinks it is true. He thinks it is true because he gets pleasure out of it. End of part four.